for the past few Sundays, we have been thinking about church, what it means to be a, a part of a body of Christ, a bride of Christ, this royal priesthood, as the New Testament refers to the church. And we've been thinking along the lines that church isn't something we go to, church is what we are. Church is what we do. And so this morning, I want to kind of keep with, with that theme as we look at some some really profound words that Jesus uh, prays in John chapter 17. If you're not familiar with John chapter 17, it is right before his arrest. And uh, Jesus uh, is there in the garden and he's praying. And basically, his prayer is three things. Uh, the first part of his prayer, Jesus is praying for himself in John 17. He's, he's praying... Uh, in thinking about what it is that he's about to face. Because he knows what's coming. And so he prays for himself. The second part of the prayer is that Jesus prays for those disciples that were with him, those followers that were with him at that point in time. Because not only is he going to face some very difficult things, but they are going to face some very difficult things. And then the last part of his prayer is a prayer for us. It's a prayer for all of those in the future who would become a part of the body of Christ, who would believe in Him as Lord and Savior. And so I want you to know this morning, Jesus prayed for you. And Jesus prayed for me. But we don't want to just kind of have a, a, a nice warm feeling about that. We want to spend some time this morning thinking about what is it that Jesus prayed for? What is it that Jesus prayed about when he thought about the future believers, when he thought about the church? And so just a portion of that prayer is lifted up this morning. John 17, verses 20 through 23. Jesus said, my prayer is not for them alone. And by that he was referring to those that were with him at that time in history. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So now he's talking about all future believers. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. They may be brought to complete unity, so let the world know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. I want you to think how many times the word one appears in just those, those four verses. Jesus speaks a lot about this oneness that you and I are to have as the body of believers. And that's a powerful concept. Uh, this idea that you and I are united and the, and, and the metaphor, the illustration that he uses to talk about this oneness is the oneness that exists in the Trinity. The oneness that existed between God the Son and, and God the Father. So this is a powerful illustration, a profound prayer that Jesus gives regarding the body of believers. And that alone reminds us that being connected to the body of Christ, being a part of the bride of Christ, being a part of church is not an accessory to the spiritual life, but is integral to who we are as believers and to our vitality and passion as a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, if you bought a car any time in the past 10 or 15 years, you know that cars today are loaded with accessories. Things that have nothing whatsoever to do with the actual operation of the automobile. And sometimes, you know, when you go to the repair shop, sometimes I wish I had a few less accessories on the car. Amen. But, you know, a sunroof is not integral to the operation of a car. Seat heat is not, I know this is shocking, but seat heat is not integral to the operation of your vehicle. Those are accessories. They're niceties. We're glad we have them in our car, 
but it doesn't make the car operate or function or do its job. Well, a lot of people will view spiritually the church as being a subroof, as being seat heat. It's a nice thing, but it's really not something that's integral, critical to my functioning as a believer. You know, if, if that's your perspective on church, on the body of Christ, I just want to say to you, Jesus didn't pray for an accessory. Jesus prayed for what was a necessity. Jesus prayed for that which he knew would be integral to our functioning as a follower and as a believer of his. And so this morning, I want to I want to briefly just share what the oneness of what Jesus speaks about does for us as believers. I'm just going to give you three, three kind of quick things here. First of all, it marks us. It marks us. You know, there is something about the church that is completely different, that should be completely different from any organization on the face of the earth. We are not a civic league that just happens to have a, a little warmth for Jesus. We are different from any organization on the face of the earth, or at least we should be. And so this oneness that Jesus prays for, that Jesus stresses, marks us. It makes us different. We have a koinonia, we have a fellowship that is different from anything else in all the earth. In fact, the, the second century writer, a guy by the name of Tertullian, and I'm not going to take you down the road of church history, so don't worry about that, but I, I want to read just a few sentences that he wrote about Christians a generation or two after Jesus walked the earth. And this is, what he, this is what he wrote. He said, these Christians are very strange people. And some of you may be nodding your head and saying, yeah, yeah. These Christians are very strange people, he wrote. He said, they meet together in an empty room to worship. They don't have an image. They speak of one by the name of Jesus who is absent, but who they seem to be expecting at any time. And mind how they love him and how they love one another. In other words, when Tertullian, second century, looked around and looked at all the other people that were having gatherings and meetings and associations and whatnot, he said, compared to them, Christians are strange. They're odd. And what was so odd in Tertullian's mind about Christians was not only the method of their worship, but their union together. My, how they love one another. And so this oneness marks us, marks us, it sets us apart from anything else, any other group that's out there. Second thing that this oneness that Jesus talks about and prays about here in John 17 does is it, is it makes us. It makes us. By being a part of the body of Christ, it grows you, it grows me, it deepens me, it sharpens me. You know, if you and I were to look through the New Testament and take out all of those passages, just kind of mark them or note them, that talk about one another. Somebody said we ought to pay attention to the one another's in the New Testament, you know, that as fellow believers in the body of Christ, we're to serve with one another, encourage one another, sharpen one another, discipline one another, train one another. You take a list of all of those one another's, and when you look at what the impact and the power and the purpose of those are, it is to make us, it is to make us Christ-like, to deepen us in our walk with Him, and to impact our lives. And so this is not a thing that's an accessory. This is not a sunroof. This is integral to you and I being a believer in and a follower of Jesus Christ. So it marks us, it makes us, and then thirdly, it motivates us. It motivates us. When we come and we gather as the body of Christ, we have a common passion. We have a common purpose. We have a common goal. And part of what we do here is to, is to celebrate that passion and to celebrate that goal and to remind ourselves of whose we are and of our true identity 
and of our real nature and to motivate and inspire and encourage each other as collectively as the body and bride of Christ to move toward that end. Tony Evans likens uh, the church to, to a football team. I think it's a great analogy. So if you're a football fan, you'll, you'll, you'll just get right in sync pretty quick with this. But I want to just share with you something that Tony Evans said about a, about a football team, and you'll quickly see how it kind of aligns metaphorically with the church. He wrote, he said, I love football because it's a place, unlike many others, where a player's distinct attributes are able to be expressed displaying strength, determination, self-control, skill, power in concert with others forming a collective impact without the denial of individual contribution. So in other words, when you and I come and, and we gather as the body of Christ, we don't check our individuality at the door. We don't all of a sudden go from being a unique, uh, uniquely created person to being just kind of vanilla milk toast and just kind of come in and, and all of that said, no. No, we bring all of that unique personality and those, those traits and those skill sets that God has blessed us with, all of that we bring into the body of Christ just as a player does with a football team. He says football is oneness in action. When played well, it is unity on display. Players come from different races, different backgrounds. However, when they get on the field, they harmonize the differences toward a common goal. They do this because the goal is larger than their individual preferences. And you know that is a, a good metaphor, working metaphor for the church, that you and I bring our individuality into the body of Christ that is harmonized with all of the passions and skill sets and talents and personality traits of every other individual within the body of Christ. And each of us recognizes that there is a goal that exceeds the individual. There is a purpose that is beyond me as just one, one person. And so Tony Evans goes on to write, he said, if any football player decides that his own person is more important than the team, then he no longer belongs on the team. In fact, the football team is better off without him. It's pretty harsh stuff, but it's true. By the same token, the team then is diminished because they then do not have the benefit of his or her talent or skill set. That's true. It motivates us that we come together and we share together as individuals but collectively as the body of Christ for a common purpose, a common goal, which is to pursue the calling that Christ has given to us to make him known in the world and to live out deeply and maturely and seasoned as a follower of his. So those three quick things, but I want to I want to share with you this morning as I close. You know, there's some real barriers to that. I know that, you know, when you hear, you know, marks us, makes us, motivates us, um, you know, okay, that, that sounds good. That sounds good. Amen. I'm, I'm with you. I got it. I'm standing. But let me tell you something. Being present at church has not the same thing as being a participant in the body of Christ. And there are some barriers that we can have to truly allowing this oneness to impact our lives. And I, I want to just name five of them real quick, real quick this morning. One is blindness. This is the attitude that says, you know what, I don't need church to be a believer. I don't need church to be a believer. Well, I'm sorry you think Jesus was wrong in John chapter 17. That's all I can say. If you don't think you need church to be a believer, if you don't think you need to participate in the body of Christ to be a believer, I'm sorry that you think Jesus was all mistaken about that. Because Jesus, prior to his arrest, knowing what was going to impact him, again, I don't think he's praying for an accessory. I don't think he's praying for a nicety. He's praying for that which he knows is critical and needed in the life of the believer, which is a connection with the body of believer. But we can take that attitude that, you know what, I don't really need church to be a believer. Secondly is isolation. I don't need to be held accountable to anybody. I don't need to be held accountable to anybody. That's, that goes back to all of that list of one another's. 
you know, where we're encouraging one another and sharing with one another and praying for and with one another and teaching one another. And, you know, if, if we think we don't need all the one another's, um, that's going to be a real barrier to us experiencing deeply and truly this oneness that Jesus is talking about here and praying for in John chapter 17. Third one is distrust. That's where we say, you know what, I don't want to risk. I don't want to make myself vulnerable to anybody. I don't want to share anything. I don't really want to connect with anybody at a personal level. You know, I don't want to get burned. Uh, and so, you know, I'll just kind of show up, but I'm not going to open up. I'll be present, but I'm not going to participate. Um, and again, if that's the attitude that we bring, there's a huge barrier to the tremendous oneness, the power of oneness that Jesus talks about. The fourth one is busyness. These are just people who say, you know what, I'm a believer, but I just don't have time for church. I just don't have time for church. Now, there's another word that we could insert there. Not only busyness, but we could insert laziness. I'll just let other people do it. I'll just let other people. I'll just let other people, you know, do the ministry. I'll just let other people serve. I'll just let other people, you know, do all of those kinds of things. But I'm too busy or, you know, I don't think any of us promise that I'm too lazy, but we'll just say, I'm too busy. And, uh, and that's a huge barrier. Let me give you a fifth one. And this list certainly is exhaustive. But arrogance. Already know enough. Already know enough. There's nothing that more that I need to learn. There's nothing more that I need to know. And I'm good. And you know, I kind of touched on this a week or two ago. And you know what? The one thing that seemed to upset Jesus the most when you look at his his ministry there in the Gospels was this last one, this arrogance. Uh, when he looked at people that had this spiritual pride about them, that uh, they just believed that they were kind of above everybody else, and that uh, they knew everything that there was to be known, and, uh, and there was just nothing further that they really needed to do. They, they didn't need to mature or grow anymore. They were called Pharisees. And man, they, those people just rubbed in the wrong way. You want to see Jesus get mad, and he did get mad, you read about some interactions he had with that group. Well, if we bring that in the body of Christ, that arrogance, we're not going to experience the power of oneness. Or if we don't think we can learn anything, if we don't think there's any more growth to be had, if we think we're kind of mature enough, man, that just shuts that power of oneness down pretty quick. So I want to, want to close with a, with a little illustration. Some of you are aware of you just kind of keep up with news and, and that kind of thing. We, we've got a bee problem. B-E-E. -E, right? The honeybee problem. Right? The honeybees are in decline. And for agriculturalists, this is huge. This is a huge problem. You may not think, you know, you know it's a big thing, but, but this is huge because uh, not only do, do people like to have honey and honey needs to be produced, but these bees uh, provide a critical role in the ecosystem of pollinating trees and orchards and and all kinds of things that depend upon them doing what they do. And so because this bee population has just kind of gone off a cliff in terms of their numbers, a lot of universities have tried to study this issue and, and try to figure out what's going on, what's going on. And so two or three universities got together and uh, did this rather large study. I don't know how you do this, but they were able to put little tags on bees. But I don't know how you do that. I don't know what kind of tag you put on a you put on a honeybee. But they put some kind of little tag on these honeybees, and they determined their flight patterns and migration and, and all of this kind of thing. And uh, and ultimately they came to a conclusion that uh, that bees were declining in population because they were not able to find their way back to the hive. And the primary reason that they weren't able to find their way back to the hive was because of certain chemicals that were in pesticides or insecticides, and it would disorient the bee, and they could not get back to the hive. Okay. There's a phenomenon for all of that. It's called CCD, Colony Collapse Disorder. Colony Collapse Disorder. Now, I want to suggest to you this morning that if we're not careful, we can have CCD. Christ-likeness collapse disorder. If we're not finding our way on a regular basis to the hive, that, spiritually speaking, is the body of Christ. 
And what they found with these bees was that even though we might think, well, why can't a bee just kind of function on its own? I mean, it ought to be able to feed itself, shelter itself, get water, and kind of do its thing, and fly from flower to flower to flower, you know, even if it can't get back to the hive, it ought to be able to survive on its own. They said, no, it just couldn't. But if the bee didn't get back to the hive, it would not eat. If the bee didn't get back to the hive, it would not sleep. If the bee didn't get back to the hive, it would not shelter. It would not nourish itself, and it would, it would die. And if we are to truly take seriously the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the passage, passages in the New Testament that speak to the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, this royal priesthood, this thing that we call church today, we must understand and we must take seriously that if we're not connected to the high, spiritually, we will go into a state of decline and collapse. Jesus didn't pray for oneness. Because it was a nicety. He prayed for one mess for you and for me because it was a necessity. Let's pray again. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of being a part of the body and bride of Christ. And Lord, forgive us when we think it's a sunroof, when we think it's sea heat, when we think it's a nicety something that is not critical and crucial to growing and maturing as your disciple. And yet, Lord, we're reminded of the words of Jesus in that prayer, that great prayer, John 17, that he prays that we might be one, that we might be united together, that common bond being our Lord Jesus Christ, and that that oneness would mirror, would reflect the oneness that exists between the Son and the Father and the Spirit, and how powerful that union is. And so, Lord, we thank you today that you not only called us unto yourself, but you also called us unto each other as the body of Christ. And so, may we know what it is to experience the awesome oneness of the church. In Jesus' name we pray.